Hello students. Today we're going to be talking about the integumentary system, chapter 5 of our book. All of the functions and structures associated with the integumentary system, which includes what everybody should know, the skin, but also some accessory structures like the hair, various glands like oil glands, sweat glands, the nails, there's also special sensory receptors and sensory organs that allow us to detect certain types of tactile stimulation, temperature changes, thermoregulation, and all of that. So we're going to be talking about that. Some basic functions of the integumentary system include the maintenance of homeostasis in several ways. Thermoregulation is a regulation of body temperature. So we'll talk a little bit about how the skin and the integumentary system as a whole is involved with increasing or decreasing our body temperature. Vitamin D is also produced by the skin. And we'll talk about what vitamin D is a little bit in this chapter. We're going to continue with that in chapter 6. But then your skin is also a very uh, effective sensory organ in the body. So the skin is the largest organ in the body, and it really does a lot for us. Um, and you know you sense uh, various types of different stimulation, touch, pressure, vibration. You know the difference between hot and cold and the like, pain. All of that is sensed with special receptors associated with the skin and the integumentary system as a whole. As an animation, you can look at an overview of the system. I really uh, suggest that you watch these various animations and these PowerPoints. So the skin itself has two major layers. The top layer, or most superficial layer, is called the epidermis. And deep to the epidermis is what we call the dermis. Now below the skin, we have tissue is called the hypodermis also referred to as a subcutaneous or sub q layer it technically is not part of the skin it lies deep to the skin and we can find areolar connective tissue there along with a fat pad adipose tissue so our fat pad that lies beneath the skin proper uh, is part of that hypodermis now, on the lecture test, we're not going to be identifying any structures on the skin, but I like to go over the parts so you can see it as we talk about them. On this simplified picture of the skin, you see at the top this layer up here, just from the top to this little line right here, that's called the epidermis. So that is composed. All right, sorry about that, students. <clears throat> so the epidermis is just the very top layer of the skin, and it is composed of a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, which is a tissue covered in Chapter 4. So below the epidermis, from this level down to here, is called the dermis. The dermis is separated into two major regions. The first 20% or so by volume, just underneath the epidermis, is called the papillary region. The other 80% of the dermis, which is obviously the majority of the volume of the dermis, is called the reticular region. So ultimately in the dermis, primarily composed of areolar connective tissue just in the papillary region, and then below that is a dense irregular connective tissue, a bunch of collagen fibers running at irregular angles in here, also covered in Chapter 4. And up here we have some collagen fibers with some elastic fibers and an areolar connective tissue. All of this connective tissue is a supportive tissue for all of these other structures that are associated with the skin, which includes capillary beds found in these little indentations that you see which are called dermal papillae 
So if you look on this side, the picture where they relieve the epidermis back, you can see the dermal papillae. So there's capillary loops, small arteries and veins. The deeper you go into the dermis and in, obviously into the hypodermis, the arteries and veins get bigger and bigger. That's one reason why if you have a very deep cut, you bleed more than if you have a fairly superficial cut into the dermis. There's also hair follicles with hairs, associated sebaceous or oil glands, sudoriferous glands for the per production of sweat, perspiration, so to speak, uh, tactile sensory structures like the Meisner corpuscle here, free nerve endings associated with the dermis going up into the epidermis here, involved in various sensations like uh, thermo, uh, thermo uh, sensations for being able to determine hot and cold, um, pain receptors and the like. There's also these little muscles that attach to the hair follicle that when they contract, when you get cold, give you goosebumps because it stands the hair up at the surface of our, of our, of our body. And so these little muscles are called erector pili muscles. We have deep tactile sensory receptors as depicted here. This is called a lamellated or Pacinian corpuscle. It's at the border of the reticular region of the dermis, deep in the dermis and the hypodermis. So it detects deep touch pressure vibration. So again, you should look at the picture so you know what these structures are. As, as you learn about them through this chapter, you're going to be identifying these types of things in lab. We're not having identification on our lecture test. Now associated with the epidermis are four basic types of cells that we have to cover. And about 90% of all of the cells that form that keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that forms the epidermis are keratinocytes. The keratinocytes at the very surface layers of the epidermis, as we're going to learn, are, are dead cells involved in, in protecting us. We also have melanocytes deeper in the epidermis. These are the cells that produce the skin pigment called melanin. Deep in the epidermis also we have what are called intraepidermal macrophages, special types of macrophages in the skin. We call them Langerhans cells involved in helping alert the immune system whenever we become infected with a pathogen to help in our immune responses. We also have uh, tactile sensory receptive cells, these tactile epithelial cells called Merkel cells, which make contact with an underlying nerve fiber, a sensory neuron. So these cells, when the, when the skin and epidermis, I should say the epidermis is compressed in, these cells signal the neuron to fire to the brain saying you feel something. So these are light tactile sensory receptors in our, in our epidermis. There's two types of skin that cover the surfaces of our body, thin skin and thick skin. Thin skin is found covering all surfaces of our body except for the palms of your hands and the palmar surfaces of your, of your fingers, your digits, and the soles of your feet. Everywhere else we have what, what is called thin skin other than the palms of your hands and soles of your feet. And thin skin is the only skin where you would find is the only place you would find hair growing. So we call it hairy skin or thin skin. Thick skin is hairless. So there's no hair follicles in thick skin. Thick skin is found on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet only. That's the only place you find thick skin. So you would be able to determine the difference between thick and thin skin based on the presence of hair follicles. No hair follicles in thick skin, but you would have hair follicles in thin skin. Now the epidermis is composed of five basic layers, but only the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet is where you would find all five layers in thick skin.
everywhere else on our, on our body, the epidermis is composed of four layers. So the layers starting deepest to more superficial, the deepest layer, stratum basally, just above that is the stratum spinosum. Going up more is the stratum granulosum. Then the stratum lucidum. This is the layer that's only found in thick skin, not in thin skin. So in thin skin, you would go straight from the granulosal layer straight into the last layer, which is the corneal layer, the stratum corneum. But on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, you would see all five of these layers in this order. So the stratum corneum is the most superficial layer, which is the outside of our body that we see, that layer of the epidermis. Here's a simple diagram depicting the layers of the epidermis with associated cells that we just talked about. No, we're not identifying these, but you do have to know a little bit about the layers and the order in which they occur in. So more superficially up here at the surface of our body is where the stratum corneum would be. Down here, the deepest layer just above the dermis. So below there is all dermis, right? Which is the only place we find these blood vessels. All epithelial tissues are avascular, so there's no blood vessels in the epidermis. So all of this is dermis. So the very first row of cells, just this one row of cells you see right here, is referred to as the stratum basally. These cells are the cells that divide via mitosis, basically cloning themselves throughout your entire life, giving rise to all of the other cells in the epidermis. So as the cells in the stratum basally divide, they push upward, which pushes those cells upward, which pushes those upward. So there's a migration, an upward migration from the deeper layers up into the more superficial layers of the epidermis as the stem cells in the stratum basally divide. So this migration patterns from the very bottom layers up into the more superficial layers until they get to the very top of the stratum corneum, and then they slough off, exfoliate off. That journey takes about four weeks on average. So we're constantly losing cells every day from the very surface of our skin. They're all dead. Ultimately, they arose from the very bottom layer of the stratum basally. Now, associated in the deeper layers, as I mentioned before, you know, towards the stratum basally and even into the spinosal layer a little bit, you have the my, uh, melanocytes, which are involved in the production of melanin, skin pigment. We'll talk about that in a second. The Merkel cells, or the tactile epithelial cells, make contact with sensory neurons, nerve fibers, if you will, that allow us to sense light touches. And the intraepidermal macrophages, which are called the Langerhans cells, help alert the immune system whenever pathogens are trying to infect our skin. So we go from the stratum basally up into what's called the stratum spinosum. The stratum basally is made of one row of cells only. The spinosal layer is about eight to ten rows of cells. And then you have what's called the stratum granulosum. You can notice in this picture it's called that because all of these keratinocytes up here have all these dark staining granules in it. So the stratum granulosum is about three to five rows of cells or so. And there are a couple of different types of granules. They have granules containing the precursor to the protein keratin. That precursor is called keratohyalin in these granules. And there's also granules called lamellar granules. These lamellar granules, basically membrane-bound sacs, are filled with lipids. So when they rupture open, they release the lipids and it keeps your skin kind of water resistant and moist and pliable. As we get older, we produce less of these. Our skin gets a little drier, a little wrinkly and alike. Now, on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, you would go from the stratum granuloso layer here into what's called the stratum lucidum. Now, all of the cells 
above the stratum granulosum. Once we get to the next layers, those cells are all dead. They're not living. So all of the cells on the outside of the body that we see are all dead, dead skin cells, epidermal cells. So on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, you have about four to six rows of these clear, flat, dead cells, which is called the stratum lucidum. The thickest layer of the epidermis is the stratum corneum. All those cells are dead as well. So all these dead cells basically is a physical barrier, a protection barrier between the outside world and our inside of our body. They're constantly sloughing off the top, but we're constantly replacing them as the cells in the stratum basally divide and divide throughout our entire life. Now, the stratum corneum is the thickest on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. It can get a little thinner. It can get up to about 50 rows of cells or so, but there are places on your body where the stratum corneum is fairly thin with respect to the number of rows of cells, like the outside of your eyelid. Uh, fairly thin stratum corneum relative to the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, let's say. So again, you're not identifying this picture, but what I do want you to know is the basic description and the order in which these layers occur in that you see on table 5.1. Right? So this goes along with the figure we just looked at, which is figure 5.3. So read through the description on each one of these layers and know the deepest to the more superficial layer, the order in which they occur in. Now, as far as the dermis is concerned, as I showed you on the earlier picture, the text information that I want you to review, uh, some of that comes from Table 5.2, obviously referring to that skin picture, Figure 5.1b. So just read over the description for the papillary and the reticular region um, of the dermis. Now, let's get into the skin pigments and skin color. So I mentioned earlier that we have these cells which are called melanocytes. Melanocytes are the cells that produce a skin pigment. It's not the only pigment, but they produce the skin pigment called melanin. Now depending on your genetics, you may produce more or less of one of these types. There's something called pheomelanin. This is a more yellowy, reddish colored pigment that can be deposited through our, our skin from the melanocyte. And the more common one, uh, which is called eumelanin, this is a brown-black pigment. So this brown-black pigment, along with the, the yellow-red pigment, the brown-black pigment is better. These melanin pigments are deposited in our skin, in our epidermal cells up here. Uh, from the melanocytes. You see here the melanocyte with a little cytoplasmic membrane extensions. These melanin molecules absorb wavelengths of light from the sun to protect our cells from UV damage and just damage in general. So our skin tones and colors can range, as you already know, from someone being very dark to someone being very light and different shades and hues of more yellowy tones and redder tones in our skin. Some of that is due to the type of melanin that our melanocytes make, which is based on our genetics. Basically the genes you inherit from your parents. But we have other pigments as well that add to our skin color. For instance, lighter skinned individuals have a more red tone in their skin because what we're actually looking at through the surface of the epidermis, which is somewhat clear depending on how much melanin is made, we're looking at the blood flow in the blood vessels that lie in the lower dermis, in the papillary region of the dermis. So hemoglobin is a red pigment found in our red blood cells that carries oxygen. And in lighter skinned individuals, that is to say, individuals making a lighter melanin or less melanin altogether, their epidermis is lighter and 
we can see what's lying below in the dermis, which is the, are those blood vessels. There's also a yellowy orange pigment called keratin. These keratines, these are plant pigments and they can be stored into uh, our epidermis and up into our stratum corneum as we consume more of these types of plant derived uh, food items that have these types of yellowy orange pigments in them and those pigments can be part of what gives our skin its color. Those pigments can also be stored in adipose tissue. Now as far as some clinical uh, observations dealing with the skin and the epidermis, um, I want you to know what albinism is. I'm sure you heard of albinos. Albinism is a genetic uh, disorder where an individual that is afflicted with albinism, who, whom we would call an albino, they inherited two bad genes, one from each parent. This is a homozygous recessive disorder whereby the genes they inherit from their parents do not code for the enzyme tyrosinase. And tyrosinase is the enzyme that is required for the production of melanin. So if you inherit the al albinism uh, genes from both parents, then your melanocytes will not be able to make melanin. In which case, afflicted individuals don't produce melanin. Even their eye, which if you've, if you've seen an, an albino, their iris on their eye looks pink. There's no color in there. The reason why it looks pink is a reflection of light from the back of the eye back out through the smooth muscle of the iris. So albinos don't make melanin because they basically inherit a defective tyrosinase gene from both parents. Now, someone could be a carrier of the albinism gene. They inherit a good gene from one parent, but the defective gene from the other parent. They would still make some melanin but they have the possibility of passing on the albinism gene to their children. So those types of individuals are called carriers. Now, vitiligo is a chronic disorder of, of depigmentation of the skin, patches of the skin. Um, the immune system attacks the melanocytes and starts killing them off. So this is an autoimmune disorder uh, whereby melanocytes are lost in patches of the skin and the, those patches of the skin obviously would look a lot lighter than the other patches around it where the melanocytes are still active. So anyone can uh, get this particular uh, disorder. Uh, it's more identifiable in darker skinned individuals because the skin patch that is affected would be a lot lighter than the surrounding uh, epidermis, but like I said, any anyone can get that. It's called vitiligo. Now the hypodermis uh, in this picture that we looked at earlier of the skin is just this little section that we see at the bottom. All of this yellow that you see down here is the artist rendition of the fat pad, uh, adipose tissue. Uh, there's larger arteries and veins down here uh, just into the hypodermis and in the reticular region you have these deep pressure sensitive receptors, there's nerves running through here. This is called the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. There's also a small amount of areolar connective tissue in the hypodermis along with adipose tissue. Now as far as the accessory structures are concerned, they include hair. Hair is present on most of the body or can be. It's obviously determined by your genetics as well. Uh, it, only in thin skin though. Hair follicles are not associated with thick skin, which is on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. The hair that we see on the outside of our body is technically composed of dead keratinized epidermal cells. This is an epidermal derivative. That's where our hairs come from specialized epidermal cells in the hair follicle divide throughout our life, making your hair grow, and show so what's called the hair shaft 
on the outside of our body is basically dead epidermal cells, keratinized epidermal cells. So you can see here a little picture of it. No, we're not identifying this. This is the top of the epidermis, the epidermal cells here. This is a scanning electron micrograph, by the way, very, very magnified. And so above the epidermis, on the outside of our body, that part of the hair is called the hair shaft. The follicle is what is embedded in the dermis of our skin. So the uh, hair follicle uh, has what is called the root, the hair root. That's the deepest part, and there's two different parts to the hair root in the dermis. The first part is what we call the inner part is called the epithelial root sheath. There's a couple of layers to that you're going to see in lab. And then the outer part, which is called the dermal root sheath, predominantly that connective tissue on the outside. So we're not identifying these parts. Just know we have the shaft that's above the surface of the skin. The follicle is below the, I, I know I put it below the level of the skin. This really means epidermis when I say skin. So I, I should have written above the epidermal surface and below the epidermal surface. All right. Sometimes I interchange skin for epidermis. That's, that's uh, something I, I should get out of the habit of doing. So the root itself is embedded in the dermis composed of these two layers, an epithelial sheath and a dermal sheath. Now, there's several types of glands I want you to be aware of associated with the skin uh, in the integumentary system. These uh, glands are supported by the dense irregular connective tissue in the dermis of the skin. So we have oil glands, which are called sebaceous glands. These are uh, typically associated with a hair follicle and they, they empty their product, which is called sebum, out onto the hair, which protrudes up to the surface of our skin. Those are called sebaceous glands. The eccrine sweat glands are the most numerous of the sweat glands, which you see here in the picture. This little coiled looking little tube, that represents an eccrine sweat gland. It has a sweat duct that goes to the surface of the body and empties sweat or perspiration to the surface of our body, which is involved in thermoregulation. The apocrine sweat glands are located in uh, hairier places on the skin, like in your armpits, in, on the face of bearded men and the beards on the face in men, um, in the groin area, and in the areolar area uh, of the mammary glands in the female reproductive system. So these apocrine sweat glands are actually involved in um, producing what we call a milky sweat or smelly sweat because it's associated, you see this one right here is associated with this hair follicle right here along with the secretion of the sebum um, onto the hair. This would cause a, a musky sweaty smell and these actually become, these sweat glands become activated uh, during emotional times or stressful times. So we sometimes call that emotional sweating um, or nervous sweating. We also have specialized uh, glands, modified sweat glands in our ear canal. These are called serominous glands. These serominous glands produce earwax, which is called cerumen, which is a protective coating in our external ear canal. Now, table 5.3 has some information in it that I want you to make sure you go and review. You're not going to be looking at everything, but if you look at the top, it talks about sebaceous glands, the eccrine and the apocrine sweat glands, uh, uh, as well as the ceraminous glands. All right. So on this table, I basically want you to review the area of distribution for the glands. I want you to review the secretory product or secretion of the glands and then just the function of the glands secretion that you see down here so you're going to be reviewing uh, the distribution row for each gland the secretion row for each gland and the functions of their product from each gland now the basic functions of the skin include thermoregulation this is obviously the regulation of body temperature so everybody knows that when you get hot, you sweat. 
So perspiration, that water, electrolytes are secreted out there. When it evaporates from the body, it pulls heat away from our body, which will cool the blood off in the dermis of the skin, thereby cooling you down. And we'll talk just briefly a little bit more about that in a second. Your skin can also act as a blood reservoir, a lot of blood vessels in the dermis of our skin. Your skin is our first line of protection. Let's face it, it's our physical barrier between the outside world and the inside world, external and internal environments. So it does a pretty good job, but if we compromise the skin, like if you get a burn or an abrasion or a cut, you're creating a portal of entry through the epidermis to the underlying layers of the integumentary system and possibly introducing pathogens, microbes, bacteria, whatever, to, to your body. So you have to clean it up, you know, put some neosporin on there and stuff like that. And then you put a Band-Aid on it, depending on how severe the cut is, of course. On a deeper cut, you might need stitches, you know. But nonetheless, when it's intact, our skin is a very good protective organ. Our skin is also involved in cutaneous sensations. Like I said earlier, you know when it's cold, you know when it's hot. You can feel pressure, light touch, deep touch, vibrations, right? Those are all called cutaneous sensations, tactile stimulation. You're feeling something physically. Our skin also is involved in excreting substances like the glands we just looked at. Sudoriferous glands produce perspiration. Your sebaceous glands produce oil, so forth and so on. Your skin is also involved in absorption. We can absorb certain things through the lining of our skin. I mean, if we couldn't, you wouldn't have the little, you know, various medicines that are patches, like the nicotine patches and whatnot. And then our skin's involved in the production of vitamin D. So let's look at these just briefly. So in thermal regulation, when you get hot, you sweat. Obviously, if you're cold, you don't sweat. But we also have changes in blood flow through the dermis of our skin. So when we're hot, the blood vessels in the dermis of our skin get bigger in diameter. That's called vasodilation. That allows more hot blood to reach the surface of our body and heat can dissipate through our skin and thereby it would cool our, our, our blood off. That cooler blood would run through your body and then cool your body temperature down. However, when you're cold, you don't want your warm blood going to the surface of your body. You want to keep that heat in the core of your body. So when we're cold, we actually get a decrease in the size of the diameter of the blood vessels in the dermis of the skin, which is called vasoconstriction. In this way, we decrease the volume of blood flow that gets to the surface of our body, and that way we reduce heat loss when we're cold. Now, like I said earlier, at rest, our blood vessels in the dermis of our skin hold a lot of blood for us as, it, as blood is moving through our skin. So about 8 to 10% of your total blood flow can be going through the blood vessels in your dermis at any one time. So in times of stress or during what we call a fight or flight response, and we have to send more blood to vital organs to meet the demand of the stressor, and we're going to learn about that later on, we can actually shunt blood away from the surface of our body, from those blood vessels. So we can gain about 10, up to 10% of our blood volume that we can then send to other organs in the body, taking that blood away from our skin briefly during those uh, fight or flight uh, reflex responses. Now, as far as protection, we have a protein called keratin. All of our superficial cells in the stratum corneum and the stratum lucidum, if we're on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, and the epidermis, that keratin, all those cells are dead and they're filled with this intermediate protein called keratin. This is a tough, water-resistant protein. It's a protective protein. It makes our, our top of our epidermis very good at protecting us from the outside world. Although it's not perfect, you can still cut down through your epidermis, I'm not saying that, but since we have so many of those dead cells, you might have a slight abrasion. You'll scrape some of the cells off, but we still have a, many more cells below it to protect us. We also have lipids that are released from the lamellar granules. 
This helps keep our skin moist and pliable, um, as well as retards the growth of certain types of bacteria, not all. Same thing with sebum. Sebum is a lipid type substance on oil and it's acidic. Our sweat is acidic. So these various types of lipids and our sweat, acidic sweat, these all, all these secretions help prevent or at least slow down the growth of certain microbes that can cause infection. Melanin from the melanocytes help protect us from UV radiation. And then the macrophage by absorbing sunlight. And the macrophages, uh, intraepidermal macrophages or the Langerhans cells, can roam around in the epidermis and signify the immune system when pathogens are trying to, to cause infection. So these aid in our immune responses, or at least they aid in eradicating bacteria and other pathogens that might try and cause infection. Now, as far as uh, the cutaneous sensations are concerned, as I mentioned before, we have these tactile uh, sensory receptors that allow you to feel touch and pressure, vibration and a tickle, like the Merkel cell at the bottom layer of the epidermis, stratum basal. You have the Meissner corpuscles embedded in the dermal papillae in the papillary region of the dermis. You also have the deeper lamellated or pacinian corpuscle deep in the dermis and just at that hypodermis transition. All of those allow you to feel these tactile st stimulations in your environment. Our thermosensitive receptors are called thermoreceptors. They allow you to feel hot and cold. And then we have pain receptors. Pain receptors are called nociceptors, um, but you could just say pain receptor is fine. Obviously, we could feel pain through our skin. You guys know that. Now, as far as excretion and absorption, excretion is the eliminations of substances from the body. So all those glandular secretions are eliminating certain compounds to the surface of our skin. Sebaceous glands are releasing oil, which are a bunch of lipids, and sweat is mainly water, but a whole bunch of electrolytes, salt basically, all in there can be eliminated in that fashion. Your skin's also involved in absor absorbing substances from the environment, uh, from the external layers of, uh, that touch the external layers of our epidermis. So I'll put here transdermal drug administration. This happens to be uh, the type of drug administration, getting the, the medicine in your body, where someone would put a patch on, like the nicotine patches I mentioned earlier. So some drugs that are lipid soluble can be put in these patches and you put the patch on your skin and the, and the drug is slowly but surely absorbed through the linings of the epidermis down into the dermis, into your skin. I mean, I'm sorry, into the, the blood vessels of, of the dermis. And that's how the, the medicine gets in your body, through the skin via transdermal drug administration. Your skin is also involved in producing a precursor molecule to vitamin D. So when UV rays, ultraviolet rays from the sun, hit your skin, your epidermis, the cells in there convert basically cholesterol, cholesterol molecule, into an inactive form of vitamin D. Now vitamin D exists in our body in several different forms of activation. It's first produced or the beginnings of it is produced in the skin. It then is modified in the liver and is completely modified into the most active form of vitamin D in the kidney. So we'll learn a little bit more about that, but I'll just introduce here now that vitamin D is a vitamin amongst its other functions that is responsible and required for us to absorb calcium and really magnesium from the foods that we eat in our intestinal tract, our gastrointestinal tract. So in the absence of vitamin D, you, you don't have a maximal absorption of calcium from the, from the foods that you're consuming. We need vitamin D to, to absorb that calcium in the lining of our, in our gut, of our gastrointestinal tract. All right, the last thing we have to cover in the chapter 
uh, is wound healing. We're going to go over two types of wound healing. The first type is called superficial or epidermal wound healing. And it's pretty simple, simplified here. It's a fairly simple wound to heal, happens fairly quickly. But what is this? Well, epidermal or superficial wound healing occurs when you cut down through the epidermis, but you don't cut into the dermis. So basically, you have a, a, a slight abrasion or something, and it rips away some of the cells of the epidermis through the epidermal layers that we covered. So in an epidermal wound, you won't bleed because there's no blood vessels in the epidermis. If you bleed, that means you cut down into the lower dermis and you cut open a blood vessel that lies in, in the dermis. So during epidermal wound healing, which happens a lot more quickly than, than uh, deep wound healing, basically we have the cells of the epidermis have to migrate across the wound site. As they migrate across the wound site, this is called bridging the wound. And once they migrate across the wound site, the cells divide and divide and divide and divide and divide, making new cells which get pushed upward and get pushed upward and get pushed upward until the epidermis is thickened all the way back to its appropriate thickness through all of the layers. So you can imagine this process is not uh, is a very efficient process because you might get a little epidermal wound, you don't even know it, and it's healed up in a day. But ultimately, whenever you have a wound, notice I said earlier, the stem cells in the stratum basally is where all the other epidermal cells come from. And it takes a journey of about four weeks for the cells to get to the top. Well, when you cut down through your epidermis and, and deep wound healing in a minute in your dermis, we don't have to wait four weeks to replenish all these cells. Various signal molecules are released when we have a wound, and it causes the stratum basally cells to divide faster than they normally would. And if they're dividing faster, they can replenish the cells that are missing more quickly. Now, <coughs> excuse me, in deep wound healing, we have four basic phases. I want you to go in your book and review these phases. It's at the very end of the chapter. The first phase is what we call the inflammatory phase. The inflammatory phase occurs in order to bring more blood cells, white blood cells, and nutrients and the like to the site of damage. The white blood cells are going to be required in order to fight off infectious agents trying to get into the wound site, which is called a portal of entry. So we start and begin the wound healing process with what is called the inflammatory phase. We then go through the migratory phase, similar to what I showed you on epidermal wound healing earlier. I'll show you in a picture in a minute. Then we have the proliferative phase. That's where the, the epidermal cells divide, divide, divide. They proliferate to try and replenish all of the, the layers of the epidermis that were cut away. And then we have the maturation phase. And the maturation phase is when the wound healing is complete and then the scab will slough off. So here is the picture of what at least a portion of deep wound healing would look like. So what they show you on this picture is the first two phases, the inflammatory phase and then the maturation phase. So let me describe to you off of this picture, although you're not identifying this picture, I want you to know the, phase, the text information on the phases a little table in your book at the very end. Just go look up those phases. So I'm going to describe them briefly here for you. During the inflammatory phase, you get a, a, a mild amount of inflammation, depending on what type of wound we have. So inflammation, as we're going to learn really in AMP2, a part of inflammation is an increased blood flow to an area. So initially, when we cut down through our skin, we're going to bleed if we go down into the dermis. Depending on how deep we go, we cut larger vessels, we bleed even more. 
So during the inflammatory phase, we have more and more white blood cells being delivered to this site of damage. A whole bunch of different nutrients coming to this site as well, along with antimicrobial substances that we learn later. We also have clotting proteins all being activated in here. So during the inflammatory phase, we end up having all of the cells coming to the site that we need to help fight off infection. All of the building blocks and other materials that the cells need to heal and replenish all the damaged tissue is coming into this site. But during this phase, we also start to form the blood clot. So the blood starts to clot up. And obviously, you know, a blood clot is meant for us to stop bleeding, to stop blood from flowing out of the surface of our body. But it does more than that. Not only does it prevent the blood from leaving our body, which is bad, we need the blood in our, inside of our cardiovascular system, but it also seals off the wound site to prevent further entry of pathogens. This blood clot basically binds the wound edges together. I know we're looking at a 2D picture, but in three dimensions, this wound edge all around would be bound together by this clot protein, these fibrin clot fibers that are in here of the, of, of the blood clot. We'll learn about that later. But So we're going to stop blood from leaking out. We're going to bind the edges of the wound site together, and we're going to prevent the entry of other pathogens. So what happens here? Well, all of the cells of the, of the bottom of the epidermis, the stratum basally, start to migrate along the wound edge that's bound together by our blood clot material. So we would go through the migratory phase. During this phase, the cells migrate and then they touch each other and they start to divide, which leads to the proliferative phase. They divide, divide, divide to replenish the layers of the epidermis. But what's happening in the dermis? Well. Obviously, we're not producing epithelial cells down here. It's all connective tissue. Dense irregular connective tissue, some areola up here in the papillary region. So we, we have to start replacing all of these collagen fibers that were ripped away when we cut through the skin down into the dermis. The blood vessels themselves also have to repair and regenerate in that area. So we have vascular uh, regeneration down here. And we start to have fibroblasts lay down collagen fibers in the wound site. When collagen fibers are laid down by the fibroblast in the wound site, they're laid down at a more regular pattern than the surrounding dense irregular connective tissue collagen fibers. In which case, you see this, a scar. So when you cut down through your skin into the dermis, you have a possibility of scarring. Now, scarring is different in everybody, depending on how bad the cut is, how if, you, if it was infected, what's the nutritional state of the patient, how well did the, the wound heal. All of that matters, along with your genetics for that matter. But nonetheless, scars occur because of collagen fibers being laid down in holes that were made in the dermis. Your epidermis does not scar. There's no scars in the epidermis. The scars that you see from the surface of your body are all in the dermis. And it's collagen fibers that are laid down by these fibroblasts. So basically it's like the people that fix the roads and they potholes in the road, they put a little asphalt in there. Yeah, it fills a hole in, but you can see it. It looks a little different from the surrounding road. That's sort of what our fibroblasts are like. They fill in the pothole. Here's the pothole, which is the wound that we just created when we cut our skin down into the dermis. So the fibroblasts fill in the pothole. Sometimes we see it from the surface of the body and sometimes we don't. So you have the inflammatory phase, then the migratory phase, the proliferative phase where the epidermal cells divide, 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 and then scar tissue being laid down in the dermis. And then the maturation phase is when the epidermis is replenished to its normal thickness. And then the scab, which is a remnant of the original blood clot to begin with sealing up our wound site, sloughs off of the body. Let's face it, the scab, and thus the, the, the blood clot that we formed, is our body's natural band-aid. 
And once our wound is healed, we don't need the Band-Aid anymore, and it will slough off the surface of the body. All right, so that does it for Chapter 5. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, and work into Chapters uh, 1, 4, and 5, which is uh, continue to work in those chapters. That's what's going to be on our our first unit test.